you. First, the, the presentation I gave in um, the middle lectures about what's controllable and what's not may somewhat lead to a misapprehension about the material in the later lectures on concept formation. The first concepts, like table, which is pretty much all we discussed, blue, they are not really controllable because they're formed at age one or two, and the child does not yet have concepts of consciousness. It doesn't have the ability to understand epistemology, you know, what it should be doing, and it's impossible to get those concepts wrong. So they are as infallible as sense perception. You can't get the concept table wrong. And uh, the late Dina Faderman said in response to my saying that, she said, well, I called a tea caddy a table when I was very young. And so I got it wrong. No, that's not wrong. Whatever similarity a child sees at the beginning, is valid. There's no way to criticize that. Yes, maybe a tea caddy, you know, it's on wheels. Maybe a tea caddy wouldn't be called a table by an adult. That doesn't matter. It's a valid concept. You can't say, oh, the one year old formed a package deal. That has no meaning. So the first concepts are not uh, the ones that we have to have guidance for or could have guidance for. Nevertheless, we, ha we study them because they provide the model for the more complicated, sophisticated, adult-type concepts where we can go wrong. So the, um, the conceptual level is volitional and fallible, but not its very first steps. We study the very first steps to see how the thing works, and then we can use that as the standard for the actually controllable, criticizable, revisable, fallible, I'm out of vivals, uh, later abstractions from abstractions. So uh, you could get furniture wrong, you probably wouldn't. You could get animal wrong, you probably wouldn't. But it's certainly when you get to uh, contract, yeah, uh, a lot of people get that wrong or get it woozy, get it half-baked, uh, not to mention freedom. Wait a minute, wasn't I not supposed to mention that? That's a little life out there. Um, so... <laughs> I, I think that point, point's clear, that even though I talk about the conceptual level being volitional and fallible, the first concepts really aren't. Okay, and let's take questions now from uh, the course. All right, uh, yes. So I think I have formed many, if not most, of my concepts uh, while reading, so especially fiction. Um, so in that case, I'm basically inferring from the author's context what the word means, the words coming first. And worse than that, most of the time, my goal is to understand or just enjoy the story rather than to be diligent about the, the words I'm asso forming associations or learning the concepts of. Um, I'm just wondering, do you have any thoughts on the best way to keep a well-grounded set of concepts? Yes. While okay. Yes, he says he, could you all hear that, or do I need to repeat? You, well, you're up front. Could someone in the back hear that? Yes, okay, good. Um, you have to keep very clear a quarantine in your mind between concepts that are yours and concepts that are on probation. There are concepts that can be found right away as wrong. So when you read about uh, what's a clear concept that's wrong, well, extremism, if you, when you first heard that, 
you're not old enough to have heard. What's the concept that's going around now that's clearly wrong? Solidarity? Oh, uh, microaggression. You know, you know from the minute you hear that, that's invalid. Safe places, trigger warnings, all that stuff. That's junk. So you, you can file that as, I, yes, I'm familiar with this term. It goes in the junk drawer. You keep it because it's culturally used. Then there are the terms that are on probation, like meme, where you say, I'm not sure this has been proven. And then there's the terms that don't raise alarms, but you're not sure you've gotten, uh, that you, which is the case you're talking about. So you're reading along, and there's um, a, a, a character re responds sardonically. Yeah, sardonically, it's kind of like sarcastic. I'm not sure I get that. I think I kind of get the idea. So I'm putting that in the half-get category. So it's important, it, much more important than what you do is that you establish these categories, that you identify what you're behind and are going to use yourself and endorse, and all these other categories from don't quite know what it means to, I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. So that's uh, the general principle behind the answer. The other thing is um, some terms you can't get right from the reading, from the context. I've had any number of terms that I thought I understood from the reading and the way they were used, which turned out to be incorrect. I'm trying to think of an example now, but nothing is leaping to mind. Uh, so, but I'm sure you're familiar with that phenomenon where you pick it up and you think you know what it means, but it actually means something a little different. Not often, not radically different, but considerably different from the way you uh, uh, lugubrious. Does anyone here? Think they know lugubrious? Yes. Melancholy, mournful? Yeah, it's uh, excessively mournful. So it's like over the top mournful, raises flags. Lugubrious melody is one that's so mournful that there's something gone wrong. You know, it's like a parody of mournful or something. It's excessively mournful. But when I first read it, I think I thought it meant well lubricated, and, but emotionally, so it was easy flowing or something. I had it completely wrong. I really I thought it meant something like sliding along happily, you know, well, well greased, and it doesn't mean that at all. So you can miss the meaning. But the main thing is to identify, really, uh, this is so important, so important, that you evaluate the terms, your concepts, and make distinctions among them. Otherwise, you, you sabotage your thinking. Thanks. Yes. The concept of the objective applies to the volitional. Yes. Does that mean that the kinds of low-level concepts that you were talking about in your initial statement are not objective? Well, they are volitional, but they're only volitional in this way. Uh, but, the, but this is not going to get to your question, and I have to think about it. The low-level concepts are volitional in that the child has to put forth the effort to do it. If it puts forth the effort, it's going to get it right. So if the child pays attention to table or cookie, he's going to get it right. Cookie, they're all pay attention to. <laughs> table, probably. Uh, dish. The young James Taggart resisted dish for a few months, but eventually they're so simple that even if you're out of focus, you can't help but get it. It's too easy not to get if you give either, if you either attend to it and do it 
quickly and deliberately, or you're around people who are talking about it and hands you the dishes. So there's an element of volition in how actively and quickly the young child forms the concept. But it doesn't lead to fallibility. So now to get to, to face the question you raised, would I call those objective in the sense that it's volitional adherence to reality? Gosh, that's a borderline case. Let me, let me try and commune with my inner objective self for a minute and see if I can get it. Um, It's just a, I can't see any way to say it other than it's got the seeds of objectivity in it, but it's not the full thing. The full thing is you could have departed from reality, but you went through certain processes to adhere to reality. So what you've got is a product formed the right way. So we're talking about I, uh, oh, uh, when I was young in, in um, kindergarten, one day they had us push our hands into some plaster and hold it there for a second, then take it out, and you get a paw print <laughs> of yourself, and I still have that, okay? That's how I know we did it. I still have the cast. Just as a fun thing to do. Now, it's an action. Nobody's going to do it wrong. Maybe they move the hand, but it's so simple. Is the result a product? Or is product too big a term to use for that? I don't know. And the same thing with your first concepts. Yeah, it takes a little effort, and a person can do it purposefully and with gusto, or just kind of lays his way into it. But it's not the real, it's not like when your wife is criticizing you, and you have to make an effort to keep focus on the facts and not respond defensively. There's a real easy, introspectable, in-your-face feeling of being objective when you're arguing with someone and your emotions are getting involved and you say, no, I have, to, I have to be objective. Let me put aside my ego involvement here, my defensiveness. Let's just look at the facts. Let's not try to, you know, win and fight back and put... Let's just look at the facts and, and get my personal uh, ego testing out of it. it there's, that's very, very clear. That's objectivity in the f under fire, and that's real objectivity. The ability to understand what a dish is, is, you know, so small, I, I, I hesitate to call it objective. So I, my, my answer is it's a borderline case. Okay, thank Boy, you. that was a long time to get to the borderline case there. Yeah. Thank you for a valuable course. Um, I, my question relates to, as I understand it, only mammals have uh, 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 top-level cortex, and it's basically... Neocortex. Yeah, thank you, yeah, just t tip of the tongue phenomenon. Uh, and I understand that that's basically a neural net, and it's... Uh, and basically there's really what? A neural network. A complex well, neuro, everything in the nervous system is a neural network. Okay. So my understanding of that is that basically neural networks work with being trained and then responding. So there's a training phase where they're learning a particular pattern and then they're gi given well, some inputs and they respond with some, some outputs. Is, is that also your understanding? Neural networks in computer science refer to a software setup, not to any hardware, first mm -hmm. of all. It's just a program. And what basically goes on is that um, things are weighted mm -hmm. a certain way so that if something 
if event one happens and the computer responds with response one, that will be, response one will be evaluated by something the programmer set in, like if it's closer to what we want, then give it a plus. And the computer's more likely to do it again. If it's farther from what we want, give it a minus, and it can be not just plus one or minus one, but plus mm -hmm. 10, minus eight, you know. And so in that way, it's a kind of natural selection or evolutionary process built into the software to tune it to the kind of output in response to various inputs that you want, that the programmer wants. The nervous system is uh, a network whose ultimate goal is survival and operates under the pleasure-pain mechanism. I don't think we should assume that it works the same way. It might, mm -hmm. but we shouldn't assume. So they've taken, for this um, software, feedback, naturally selected software, they've taken the term neural without any reason. That is, they don't know that this is the way neural, actual neurons weight responses, or that they work in that fashion. Incidentally, don't overestimate what brain scientists know. Uh, they know a lot on the in level of an individual neuron. They know a lot in terms of the sensory pathways, what they are coming in. They don't know anything about the kind of thing you read in the press. Like, well, when a person thinks Area two lights up in the brain, so that must be what that must be the thinking we're seeing, those lights going on and you know that is wild and crazy and the way exceeds our knowledge. And all that we are saying is when a person does something intellectually, the oxygen uptake from his blood is higher in this portion of the brain. So that could simply mean that's the area of the subconscious where that information is stored. It doesn't, it, it could mean that, that it, if it's emotionally involving, that part of the brain uh, gets involved. So we know a little something, but what you read in the media is wildly overstated. Uh, we don't know much about how the brain works on the higher levels. We will someday, and we're moving towards it, but don't get taken away. But anyway, back to what you're saying. We shouldn't assume that neurons actually communicate the way uh, software is set up to communicate. We know there are certain similarities. We know there's certain differences. So uh, don't assume the answer to that question. We don't know. Could I continue with just yeah. a small question? Thank uh, you. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, if it were the case that uh, the brain is, is to some extent working like that, that there is some training and then some prediction or playback going on. If I were to climb the stairs to the stage, I would try to predict when I put my foot down that there's something solid. And if that prediction... Well, how strictly are we going to use our concepts here? I may not be using them well, so I, I but don't But go know ahead, because I, uh, I would object to the use of the term prediction there, and so would J.J. Gibson. Okay. But I'm not sure anything hinges on but, it, so go on. Uh, so I'd just, say, just to get yeah. to the question then, what, mm -hmm. what I would ask is, is that, if, if it were the case that that was what was happening, would that be a form of cognition or uh, radically different? Well, that's a good question um, because it gets on something I wanted to say in the course but didn't have time to, and there's nothing better than that. You remember when I listed the cognitive processes, I had uh, beliefs and values, memories, and perception. Mm -hmm. There are other things. There are other things, and you put your finger on one of them here. There's what Greg Salmeri calls post-perceptual processing, which is a nice alliteration, and means the kind of things that go on after perception that aren't yet conceptual, and by after here I mean chronologically. 
The big one is forming expectations. So I wouldn't call them predictions because that's a very intellectual term. But you expect a certain result when you see stairs. You expect that they're going to hold your weight. Now that is fallible. That, mm -hmm. Those expectations, they can't really be erroneous or mistaken in the sense that a, a, a conceptual intellectual judgment can be false, but it can be not what you expected it to be. So you expected it to hold your weight, but it's made out of paper mache and you come right down. Or the, on the animal level, because we can see there that volition is not involved. Uh, just before coming, in my house in Florida, a bird crashed into the window by my study. It expected to be able to fly through that area, but not being able to see the glass, its expectation was frustrated, right? Sometimes uh, geese will land on asphalt, which is shimmering because of that heat phenomenon, it looks like water. They, they are fooled by it too. They think it's, they quote, think it's water. They expect it to be what water is, and it isn't. So those post-perceptual expectations, which are formed through learned associations, can be frustrated. That is neither the inerrant operation of the senses. It goes beyond the senses. It's connecting of the present to the past, right? An association of what they've seen before with this new case. It's neither perception nor conceptual judgment because geese don't have any conceptual judgment and neither do birds. So it's in between. It's a very minor category, but it's worth noting, and I'm glad you brought it up because it is deserving of recognition as a separate category. It's cognitive, to answer your question directly. It's it's not inerrant, it's not just the given. It's not the given. It's a learned association which may not apply in the present. It's not quite fallible in the way that judgment is. It doesn't deal with true and false. But it's kind of in between. So things can go wrong in the expectations you form from what you perceive. But to perceive is just to perceive. That can't go wrong. Wrong makes no sense there. So thank you for asking that. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I really enjoyed all four lectures, but what really impressed me... Uh-oh. There were five. I'm sorry. So one of them was bad, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. I enjoyed all five lectures. Thank you. I'm teasing you. What yeah. really impressed me was in lecture two where you divided mental processes into cognitive and non-cognitive. Uh, just for the audience here, uh, under cognitive, I have perception as the primary. Yeah. Uh, belief of values and memories as derivatives. Yeah. And then under non-cognitive processes, we have dreams, imagination, and emotions. So I was reviewing my notes on this uh, mm -hmm. in the last few days, and it looks to me like maybe when you study epistemology, you should also concurrently study psychoepistemology because the cognitive group would be epistemology primarily. The non-cognitive group, I was struck by how psychoepistemological they are well, everything for man that's beyond perception is psychoepistemology. It all, and you can see this because mm -hmm. what is psychoepistemology? What is psychoepistemology, Gene? The study of man's cognitive processes from the aspect of the interaction between the conscious mind and the automatic functions of the subconscious. I can, I can agree with that. So you have a subconscious. It's all the stored information that you've learned over your life and can access or can influence what, you, what goes on in your conscious mind. 
if you picture yourself, I don't know if that's a good choice of words, if you think of yourself at age zero, at birth or even in the womb, before you've learned anything, just take birth, you, you can't have dreams, you can't have imagination, you can't have memories yet, you have nothing to remember, you can't have anything except perception. So all the things that go on in you, your dreams, your imagination, your emotions, your thoughts, your feelings, your convictions, everything that's beyond just you know, seeing, tasting, whatever, involves the subconscious, involves stored material. It's what makes you the continuing person that you are over your lifetime. So if you try to say, well, what's not psychoepistemological? It's only direct perception. Because everything else involves what you've learned over your life. That's the short answer. Okay? Just a quick uh, summary here. I guess my real question is, when you study epistemology, would it be useful to concurrently study psychoepistemology? Okay, uh, that's, that's a good point. question. I would say useful, but not at all necessary. Um, Ayn Rand developed her epistemology at least 15 years before she developed even the concept psychoepistemology. So she did okay. Uh, she wrote Galt's speech without having the concept psychoepistemology. It's good, you know, the, the two work nicely together, but psychoepistemology is most helpful in terms of um, uh, what's the word? I'm, I'm thinking in terms of action or uh, getting results and understanding yourself, whereas epistemology is the study of what's required to get truth. So psychoepistemology is really helpful in understanding how do I get a good new idea? How do I resolve my procrastination? That is, it's great stuff. And I'm thinking of writing with Gene a book on psychoepistemology. So I'm, no one's more excited about it than we are. Still, uh, epistemology does not require that field, psychoepistemology, in order to be immensely valuable to you in its own right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, the young lady there in white. <laughs> so you, you discussed in this talk or in this class, the need to essentialize. And we've talked at length about how do you learn how to essentialize. Yeah. And I'm very curious what your answer is, your short essentialized answer is going to be is how do you learn to essentialize? Practice. <laughs> All right, the slightly longer essentialized version. Uh, practice, practice, practice. Um, <laughs> I, I, I know only two things to essentialize. Um, and I forget one of them. <laughs> <laughs> the one is throw out. Throw out. Cut. When I was nine, something like that, we had in school a, an assignment to read a story about, I think it was Dumbo the Flying Elephant or something. It was a little story. We had to read it and then write a precis or a summary of it. And then the assignment was to write a shorter <coughs> summary of it. And I really got into this. So I wrote, you know, the summary, which I have no recollection of. And then I wrote the shorter version. And then I thought, let me go, you know, let me keep going. Make shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And uh, what I remember is the end was 
elephant. <laughs> that was the summary. And that's the ability to essentialize. And I, I began it right there. Throw out everything you can, go till you've gone too far, and then put back the things that you have to. So first, the first thing, oh yes, the other thing is, um, the first thing is throw out, pare down. And not enough of you lay people do that. <laughs> We philosophers, I mean, Leonard Peikoff is the master of this. I can do it when I remember to do it. <laughs> but I've noticed that people on HBL, my list, and you can sign up for a free trial at hbletter.com, hbletter.com. Uh, people, uh, I put in a one-line summary that automat that is, when you post on the blog portion or the website portion, you get a text field that says, you know, put your post in here. And into it automatically pops one line summary, colon. And you're supposed to write your one line essentialized summary there. Few people can do it or, or do do it. So they either put in too much or they don't put in a sentence. They just name their subject, Trump. That's not a one-line summary. That's like elephant. You know, it's not a real <laughs> essentialization. It's going too far. So uh, it is something that you should practice, 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 and you should get to love throwing away words, taking out words. That is one of the things that you should gain self-esteem from doing. And the other method, the other input to essentialization is differentiation. As opposed to what? So if you write a post saying uh, Hillary's bad but Trump is worse, uh, well, that would be a good essentialization. Hillary's bad, Trump is wor worse. But you have to set up the differentiation. My subject is a comparison of two candidates. As opposed to what? Well, as opposed to a discussion of one or the other, or uh, a, a um, recommendation as to what to vote. I'm just comparing the two. That might be it. So always ask as opposed to what? Elephant as opposed to what? Well, as opposed to any other main character animal in a story, I guess. Um, there is a third thing, but it's a little bit more complicated, and that's fundamentality. And I would suggest don't even go there. I mean, if you just try to throw out, what can I throw out, what can I cut without completely destroying what I'm trying to say, you will automatically go to the fundamental. One illustration, and I'll, I'll stop and take the next one. Um, Donald Trump is a demagogue with weird hair who would destroy the Republican Party. Okay, weird hair. If you're looking for things to cut, you would see <laughs> weird hair is cuttable. That's not of the essence. And, and it's because it's not fundamental. It doesn't go anywhere. But I think if you just say, what can I possibly get out of this thing? And you're not throwing it away. You're just getting out of, out of your essentialized statement of it. You will do very well. Okay. Great, thank you. I never heard that Dumbo story. That's great. I know. I know I never told you that. But I've thought about it many times when we've discussed that, and I was waiting for the right moment. <laughs> yes? I believe Tyler was actually ahead of me. Oh. Okay. What was that? I believe Tyler was actually ahead of me because I switched lines. Oh, so you yield from, for the senator from <laughs> Tyler's law. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, if knowledge is contextual and is updated with new information, yes. why is it proper to say that one knows something to be true and then with conviction say that we now know it to be false, but that doesn't mean we didn't know it was true a month ago? How, oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Please distinguish. Now, you're getting into more advanced things that will be covered in okay. later years, but truth is not contextual. Knowledge is contextual, but not in that sense. Truth is truth whether you know it or not. Okay? It's, truth is, a, um, is not intrinsic, so you can't say it's true without evidence, but it's true whether you know it or not if there's a meaningful proposition, which means there's some evidence to consider it and you know what you're talking about. So, for instance, um, Dagny flying... The, Dagny flying after Galt's plane and seeing refractor rays of the mountaintops below her, and she thinks there's mountains down there. Where could he be? Because there's mountains below me. Now, she probably didn't form those words in her mind, but she could have, and that was what she was assuming. That's false. Completely rational. But false. There weren't mountains below her. The mountains she was seeing were somewhere else. So there were mountains, all right, but they were not below her. There was a valley below her that she couldn't see. Okay, so she did not have contextual truth. She had error. Uh, the, there are three levels here. You know, I, I got upset when you asked the question, but I didn't know this until it was explained to me, so it's not like it's self-evident. There's fact. It was a fact that there were mountains there. There, was a uh, there weren't mountains there, sorry. It's a fact that there was a valley there. There was a fact before human beings uh, arrived in the North America. It was a fact that there was a valley there. Okay. Fact is metaphysical, and only metaphysical. Knowledge and truth are both epistemological and metaphysical. They say the mind is in touch with the fact. So you can't know something that isn't the case, and you can't say it's true when it isn't the case. But the, the third thing is certainty. And certainty is only epistemological. Certainty is, does this meet the tests? Am I warranted in accepting this without doubt? So it's an internal perspective. You know, I hate to use the word internal, but it makes the point I'm trying to make now. It says... I've got good grounds, conclusive grounds, to accept this and to no longer doubt it. That is totally compatible with being completely wrong. On the other hand, let's not go crazy, it only happens about once a year. So it's not like some persistent problem we're, we're, we're taking... You, you know, you, you brought in, we, knowledge is updated, knowledge is contextual, we take in new material. Yeah, and 99.999% of the time, that new material adds to and strengthens what we knew before. So it's not like we're taking in new material, oh, oh it's another time i got to discard this belief, I take in new material, and that, this one worked out, but I take in new material, oh no, this one's wrong. If you find that, you better fix your criteria for certainty because there's something wrong with it. It should work barring extraordinary things, like somebody's invented a refractor ray that you don't know about. How often does that happen? You know, not this week. So uh, if you try and think back, when was the case that I was certain, rationally certain, but it turned out I was wrong? There's only... I can think of only one case that comes up um, repeatedly, even though it's only once a year, and that's judging people. 
And it's better to realize you, it's very hard to actually get certainty about people. Why does it come up about judging people? Why is it often the case you say, I, by everything I knew he was terrific, and then he turned out to be a fraud? Like Ayn Rand thought about Nathaniel Brandon. She was completely misled. Why is that the case? But in regard to nature, it almost never comes up. Because human beings have free will and they can fake. And not only that, the bad has every incentive to try and appear good. The good has no incentive to try and appear to be no good. I mean, that's what's cute about Francisco. He's pretending to be worse than he is. And that's, that's what great literature does. It, it turns things around. It gives you a fresh uh, uh, take on things. He pretends to be a playboy when he isn't. But that's because of the unique nature of what's going on, the mind on strike. You know, again, that didn't come up last week. Um, so would it be proper? So, so let me just finish the sentence and then. Uh, uh, so uh, bad people, good people will try to be perceived for the good people they are. Bad people will try to be misperceived for the good people they are. So it is hard to judge uh, the man-made, the human products, because of the possibility of faking. And in that area, you should be really hesitant to be certain. Okay. Uh, so then would you say that Dagny did not know that there was mountains? How can I say it more strongly? Um, she did not know that there were mountains because there weren't any mountains. You can't know what isn't so. Okay. No, she, had, she did not have knowledge. She had mistakes. She did not have truth. She had falsehood. It was not irrational. It was rational. It was, uh, she was right to think they're mountains. And if you go around thinking, well, maybe somebody's invented something that means that you guys are just a projection and I'm a brain in a vat, or, <laughs> you, you destroy everything. So you have to have grounds. And, and that's the other part of the answer to this thing. Um, well, if I can be certain and turn out to be wrong, doesn't that like shake my whole certainty and foundation of, of everything. No, because you have to have reason to think that that's going on. You set up your standards of certainty to the best of your ability to exclude wrong conclusions. Sometimes when you reach a, a wrong conclusion despite it, you learn a lesson. You say, oh, I see. I was judging human beings, which are very complex, and I was you know, making snap judgments as if I could go by surface appearances. Whatever it is, you revise your methods constantly to make them more and more accurate guides to what the truth really is. So uh, once you have some standards, you know, once we're past Aristotle, so you know what a contradiction is, and you know what a syllogism is. You have the rudiments, at least, of logic. You need evidence to doubt. And it is not, in no way shakes your, your certainty today that there was a case two years ago where you thought a stick was bent, but it was in, half submerged in water, and, and it turned out it wasn't bent, so that judgment was false. So that you need that. What, what evidence is there that something like that is going on now? And there almost never, ever will be. So, you, no, the burden of proof principle prevents you from being traumatized by the few cases in which your certainty turns out to lead to falsehood. Okay, thanks. Okay. Before I get into my own question, do you discuss the previous subject in your book or in any other lecture? Did I discuss what? The, the subject of the previous question that Tyler just asked. Do you discuss yes. that in your book or in yes. any lecture? Yes. It's in, it's in um, the chapter on proof and certainty, which I think is eight. Okay. Thank you. So uh, as to my own question, um, I'd like you to discuss uh, a hot topic in uh, psychology right now, 
the um, dorsal ventral stream uh, theory of visual perception, um, the work of Milner and Goodale. I don't know if you're- The work of who? Milner and Goodale. No, I don't know it. What um, is it? Well, uh, you may be aware of this uh, case study in the literature about a woman who had severe temporal lobe damage, brain damage, mm -hmm. um, I believe from a car accident. Mm -hmm. um, and she came out with a very extreme visual agnosia. She was no longer, not only just to uh, identify her percepts, but to have percepts at all. She had vision and she could report the fact blind that she, sight. No, it wasn't blind sight. It wasn't blind sight. No, it was she did have vision. She was not a blind sight patient and she could report that she saw colors and forms. She couldn't see shapes. However, um she was able to uh much like a blind sight patient move around the world and interact mm -hmm. with objects at a rate better than was this is this then referring to the fact that different areas of the brain are involved in motion detection and shape detection? Right, yes. Yeah. So, the, you know, the, the what stream, the uh, lateral temporal stream, and mm -hmm. the, uh, the where stream, the dorsal uh, um, parietal stream. I didn't know it, it, it connected of, that way. Okay. Of the brain, yes. Um, so, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, you're now on the, uh, the idea that humans don't begin with the sensory world. Um, sensation. Right. Yeah. So uh, this, but this woman is apparently reduced to sensation and not perception on the visual level. So I'm wondering if you could just discuss this and relate it to uh, your thoughts on perception and how that works. Uh, I think the phenomenon that there are different brain centers involved in detecting shape and de detecting motion is valid, and I think that because Professor Held, who I reference as doing the kitten experiment and who I knew from working as his intern at, at MIT, I had lunch with Gene and I had lunch with him about eight years ago, and uh, he endorsed it. <laughs> so uh, he is very, he, he's a world expert in that field, and he said it was true, so I you know, I accept it on authority. Uh, but it doesn't say anything about how uh, awareness develops. It doesn't, the fact that two different areas of the brain do two different things doesn't say anything about how we perceive or w in what sequence we develop our perception. I would bet this is true of the cult of the, of the horse and colts, uh, and they're not the only animals. You know, a lot of animals are born able to walk around within minutes of birth. So they must be getting information about a, a perceptual world. Um, so I don't think it had, I don't think it plays in to what we're saying, but if you can only see shapes and not see entities, you're not at the, that part is true, it's not perception. She actually, um, uh, this is arguable and it is mm -hmm. highly debated in the literature, but to my understanding, she cannot even see shapes. She is truly in William James's blooming, buzzing, confusion, uh -huh, uh -huh, visual flux. Uh -huh. She can't even, I think, re retain her sensations. Uh -huh. um, so uh, I guess... Um, well, what I want to argue is that I'll make a, 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 a claim of which I'm confident of and a claim I'm less confident of. The, the claim I'm confident of is that babies are not born in a blooming, buzzing confusion. They certainly are not confused. They certainly do not feel helpless. And uh, people tend to say, oh, the baby, of course, it has to depend upon its mother. It's born dependent because it's there, confused and helpless, and needs its mother. And it, that's complete anthropomorphization. That's complete reading back an adult context into the child. If you were born, uh, if you woke up one morning and didn't even know how to move your limbs, you could think, oh my God, how am I going to get my food? How am I going to keep my job? The infant doesn't know anything to compare it to. It doesn't feel helpless because it doesn't know what helping is. 
It starts from ground zero. So don't read things like confusion or helplessness or dependency into the infant, which just is born and starts, starts perceiving or sensing, whichever it is. So I know it's not confusion. It doesn't know enough to be confused. Uh, I suspect it's not blooming and buzzing. I suspect that the infant sees a blurry version of the same world we perceive. And I didn't used to think this. I got talked into this by the Gibsonians. Uh, but it this way, there's no reason to assume that it goes through a stage where it is not aware of entities. I say blurry because there are certain things involving the eyes that are unable to focus and accommodate uh, below a certain level. And uh, I think it's very nearsighted in effect. Uh, but uh, aside from that, I think it there's no reason not to assume that it has something like the spatial array of perception that we do. The fact that you can damage something in the brain and that goes away doesn't say a damn thing about uh, what goes on in infancy. Okay, uh, next question. One line summary. Uh, I need to know what a property is. So I kind of sort of know a property, a, a property, like kinda, an attribute, that right, kind of. Yes. Right. So I kind of sort of know, um, yeah. or think that it's a fact uh, of physical structure. Okay. So that's that's what I think. Uh -huh. Now here's the problem uh, from Professor A. Mm -hmm. um, quoting, of the properties of consciousness, four are fundamental and undeniable. Number two is, mm -hmm. existence has primacy over consciousness. Primacy, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I can't integrate the view of that, that, property, that it's a property? Yeah, and uh, that statement that existence has primacy or primacy well, over consciousness. Well, the property of consciousness is that it's dependent on existence. It's not a property of consciousness that existence has primacy over consciousness because part of that is existence exists uh, independent of consciousness and that's not a property of consciousness. So uh, are you quoting from my book or from yes, no, uh, ITOE? No, sorry, from your book. From my book? No, it isn't. You know, I used to formulate that as for uh, self-evident facts about consciousness. Uh, I realized that one of them wasn't self-evident, so I rephrased it. And you're right that that's the the prop. It's not a property of consciousness that this cup <laughs> exists, whether I see it or not. It is a property of consciousness that consciousness is the going out to the cup. So that's somewhat misstating. But if you want the um, more interesting question, what is a property? First of all, the, the language is not uh, settled in regard to aspects of existence, but I'll give you the best, what is it called? Um, ta, uh, the best description of the word usages that I can come up with. The widest term is characteristic. Or, no, actually the widest term is aspect which just means anything that's not an entity, but depends on an entity. Within that, you can distinguish characteristics uh, from actions. So, and I, in the book, I, as I state, I call an action a characteristic, but it isn't. It's not a characteristic of my hand that it's waving. It's an action. I just put it under that label so I wouldn't have to say every time characteristics and actions. But there are actions and there are characteristics. Um, a stronger term is attribute. I don't think all characteristics are attributes. For instance, it's a characteristic of me that I speak with a southern accent under stress. 
because I was raised in the South. That's not an attribute of me. It's a characteristic of me that I'm taller than my brother. That's not an attribute, that's a relationship. Um, it's a characteristic of me that I smoke a pipe. Don't worry, I don't inhale. And that's not a joke, I don't inhale. Um, that's not an attribute. So characteristic means anything that characterizes any fact about the thing that's true with the possible exception of actions, which don't seem to sound right, called characteristics. Attribute is narrower. Property is narrower still. Oh, let me give you Ayn Rand's definition of an attribute, an aspect of an entity that cannot be physically separated from the entity. Um, I, I feel I have left out something. Gene, do you do uh, an attribute? Uh, it's something like can be considered separately in abstraction from the entity, but cannot be physically separated. And that's very good because your finger is not an attribute of you. Your finger could be cut off. It could be, right? God help us. You know, we hope we won't, it won't happen, but it could be. Uh, your nose could be cut off. It's not an attribute of you. As opposed to what? Your height. We can't cut off your height from you your uh, uh, intelligence, we can't take out, you know, oh, we performed an operation, we took his intelligence out and put it in a Petri dish. You can't do that. So an attribute is something that cannot be physically separated, but which exists as part of, a, of an entity, but not a physical part, an aspect. And then a property, finally, to get to your question, and there's really no, zero, um, objectivist, almost zero objectivist writings on this, but I, the term goes back to Aristotle propria, and I think it means the, kind of like what you said, the structure of the thing, the attributes of the thing that relate to its actions, the attributes underlying its potentialities for action. So, for instance, I wouldn't call my, um, my height a property of me. I would call it an attribute, but I wouldn't call it a property of me. Property is like, what are the properties of sodium? Well, that it's a solid, that it burns in air, that it produces a characteristic yellow flame when it burns. So, properties are the attributes of a thing that give rise to its potentials. Its potentials come from its properties, which really come down to its structure and its stuff, what it's made of and how it's arranged, and therefore what it has the power to do. So I think that there's an action, an action slant to the term property. And that's what differentiates it from other um, attributes. Okay, Thank you there's a long answer. But you're right, I, got, I, I used the wrong term in the book. That's what he, that's what he wanted to uh, establish. Oh, so we're now applauding. Thank you, we're now ending. Oh. Thank you, and we got all the questions. That's great.